Mr. Corey Blake. About 10 years ago, I saw a film that had a profound impact on my life. It opened up in a foreign country town square with a fountain in the center and families walking their small children around the perimeter, flock of pigeons with a little boy giggling as he runs through and a squirrel's eating a nut. And the camera pans over and we see an old man who's sitting on the ground next to a low wall. And he's got an unkempt face, wearing an old dirty corduroy jacket, a worn pair of sneakers. And the camera pans over further and we see a sign. And the sign reads, have compassion, I am blind. And in front of the sign is a tin can. And occasionally, as people move through the park, here and there, someone throws a coin in the tin can or throws a coin nearby. It rolls over somewhere in the general vicinity of the old man. But for the most part, people are simply moving on with their day. Young man starts crossing through the park. He's looking dressed to the nines, really sharp suit, carrying a beautiful briefcase. He stops in front of the blind old man to survey the scene. And the blind old man reaches his hands out to touch the shoes of the person before him, his way of getting to know him. And after a moment, the young man reaches down, picks up the old blind man's sign, turns it over, pulls out a pen, and writes something on the other side of the sign. And then he places it back down, taps the old man on the shoulder, and goes about his day. And for the rest of the afternoon, nearly everybody who passes by the old blind man drops bills and change into that tin cup. So much so that it is ringing like a slot machine. It's overflowing and he's scrambling and feeling around to pick up all of the change and shove it in his pockets as fast as he can with this beautiful smile on his face. After a while, young man crosses back through the park having finished whatever business that he was tending to. And he stops again in front of the old blind man who reaches out his hands once more to see who's in front of him. And realizing who it is, he raises his face and says, what did you do to my sign? And the young man kneels down and says, I said the same with different words. And the camera pans over and what once said, have compassion, I am blind, now said, today is a beautiful day and I cannot see it. So many of us are traveling through life as the old blind man. We're desperate for connection. We want our beauty to be seen in the world. And yet we are articulating ourselves to the world in a way that the world doesn't know how to respond to us until someone comes along and has enough presence to be with us, see our poetry, and reflect it back to us and the world in a way that it cannot be denied. Since watching this film, I have been studying the question of connectivity. How do we connect? And that has led me to the study of vulnerability. I'm going to do a quick experiment with you guys. I'm going to ask you a question. Let's assume that you're going to have a profound conversation with someone that you're sitting next to today. And maybe a new relationship will be born. If I was to ask the person that you spoke with come the end of the day, to tell me something about you. What adjectives would you hope that they would use? I'm gonna ask you to actually throw those out and I'm gonna write them on the board. How would you hope that they see you in the world? Friendly. Friendly. Exciting. Exciting. Awesome, thank you. I only caught about half of those, but let me ask you this question. If I went up to your soulmate or your life partner and I asked them the same question, how many of those words might apply? Probably all of them. All right. We want to be seen by the world as we are seen through the eyes of the ones who love us most. We want to be seen by the person sitting next to us as we are seen through the eyes of the one who loves us most. Hmm. That's interesting to me. It's actually quite fascinating to me because there's a process 
that we use to find a life partner, right? We know what that is. We can actually unpack that. Well, maybe if we do, we'll gain some clues as to how we need to show up in this space today and then out in the world if indeed we want to be seen more and connect to others. So initially, whenever we are engaged in some kind of search, let's say we're looking for our life partner here, right? There's this process that we use. We go out into the world, and whether it's at a coffee shop or, or at a discotheque or at work or at school, we hear something or we see something that generates curiosity from us. It's an initial spark. It's very intangible, right? In my world, I'll give my, uh, an example from my own world. When I often tell people that I run a storytelling company, it's not unusual for me to see heads go, this, right? Like, oh, wow, what do you get to do all day, right? This is a vulnerability wall. This is something that my company does. We do vulnerability walls. We help write books for people. So suddenly, when I share that with somebody, it's not unusual that there's this kinetic energy between us, this curiosity of, ooh, what do you get to do all day, right? And it feels like kind of flirting. And if the flirting is fun and it's exciting, and then someone says to me, oh, well, how do you show up in the world? What's your day like? I say, hey, let's go to coffee. Right? And at coffee, coffee's an opportunity where I'm still going to keep it light. I'm still going to have some fun with the conversation. I want to show you a part of myself that I really think that you'll enjoy. And so maybe at coffee, I let you know that for 10 years I was an actor in Los Angeles. I was a funny guy in commercials. And my claim to fame was an award-winning spot that went viral in early 2000 where I'm playing basketball in the nude. <laughs> I appreciate the laughter very much. So now, to you, I'm like, oh, storytelling naked guy. OK, that's kind of interesting. So if I'm like, hey, you want to learn some more? Let's go to dinner. Maybe you'll say, sure, let's go to dinner. And at dinner, at dinner, I have to show up a bit differently. right? At dinner, I've got to start sharing some of my substance. I've got to share with you something that allows you into my perspective of the world, the way in which I view this amazing ride that we're on. But it's not a totally safe space yet, so I'm not going to be too risky. I'm going to share something with you that I like about myself. I'm going to share my guiding principle, which is called leading with love. Leading with love means that I try to enter every situation from a place of love. Very easy to do when things are going smoothly, very challenging to do when I'm triggered as I'm triggered as we all are as human beings. If something sets me off, leading with love tells me I have to stop, I have to slow down, take a breath, and unpack that trigger so I don't bring that negative energy undeservedly into that space. That means I have to, I have to stop and think before I show up so I can bring love to a challenging moment. OK, storytelling naked guy who tries to lead with love, right? A weird kind of interesting kind of, oh, maybe I'd, I'd like more leading with love in my life. That actually sounds delightful, right? Hmm, Mr. Corey Blake, maybe we should go on a second date. And the second date is pivotal. I can't continue to just show you the things about myself that I adore. I actually have to lean into more vulnerability. I have to give you the opportunity to reject me. And so maybe I'll share with you leading with love gone wrong. This is a project that I produced in LA, my first time producing a film. It's called The Boy Scout. I brought nine people together. We took, we, uh, took them to a, a cabin in Mammoth, California, the first iteration of what a storytelling company might be. And we wrote a bunch of scripts. And the Boy Scout was the first one that we looked at and said, we want to make this movie. And so all nine of us built a whole crew over the course of a year and created this phenomenal, adorable, heartwarming film about a Boy Scout who is literally tasked with saving the world, but can't slow down and stop himself from saving a cat in the tree or the woman whose roast is burning in the oven because he's got to do his good deeds daily. I loved this project. And I loved the people that I put it together with. And I did 9,000 things right that year to help this become a reality. But I also did something that caused the whole thing to blow up. I fell in love with one of the other nine people in the company. And she was a married woman. And while I loved her desperately and thought that I was being a hero by saving her from what seems to be an unhappy marriage, 
obviously, when it was revealed, our secret, the company blew up. She went back to her husband as she should have. And I lost the majority of my friends that I had loved so deeply through the creation of this project. Do you feel the energy shift in the room? When I lean into vulnerability, I give you two options. One of them that you might be having is, Corey, I don't like that story. That did not make me feel good. I don't want to be in relationship with you. Totally fair response. And then some of you are probably having that. And then there's the other reaction, which might be, Corey, thank you for allowing us to see you as a human being. In hearing your story, I actually see a piece of myself. And maybe I've hurt some people that I really loved through a mistake that I've made in the past. And maybe some of that shame over that incident that I've been carrying with me for a long time dissipated a little. And if it did, you might be saying, damn you, Corey Blake, for making me feel something. It's only 10.30 in the morning, and <laughs> here we are. And if we're in that feeling space, we might escalate to what I call the big night. And thank you, you got it. And the big night is an opportunity to, for me to share not only my passion and my fire for the world, but also the pain and weakness. And maybe I share with you during the big night that one of my greatest vulnerabilities is that I've spent most of my life valuing myself based on how people around me are impacted by me in the world. And the way in which they reflect back to me is how I've known myself. And that means that I'm terrified of being alone. Because if I'm alone, I won't know who I am. And in being with you in this space, I'm especially terrified. Because being with you may mean I don't have to be alone anymore. When we started dating, you saw me from the bottom of the ladder. And now maybe you see me somewhere closer to the top. So if we want to be seen in the world as we're seen through the eyes of those we love most, why are most of us traveling through life, entering relationships from down here, where we're projecting to other people what we think they need to see to like us, why aren't we entering relationship from this space where so much is possible? In my work, I have been fortunate enough to support brand CEOs and thought leaders who want to have conversations with all of their ecosystem, all of their stakeholders, customers, employees, and others from this space. And I've been honored that over 2,000 people have shared with me from that intimate spot. And that has forced me to become a safe place for other people. And in becoming a safe place, I've learned two things that I want you to consider taking with you throughout this event and then back out into the world. And the first one is 100% presence. When I'm with you, I am with you. The world is vying for all of our attention. Most of us have that electronic leash of a phone or a wristwatch that's letting us know every minute of the day that we are needed elsewhere. But when I turn that off, and I thus say to the world, world, you need to wait because this man is important to me. When I say that, and you see that happen, how much safer is the space between us? How much more likely are you to lean into vulnerability with me? Presence is not our default. Distraction is. So we have to be incredibly intentional about presence. The second piece that I want to share with you is leading with vulnerability. When I spoke to you about my loneliness, there might have been an inclination in you to want to share a secret with me. I make the space safe when I lead with vulnerability because I let you know we're equals. And from that space, there's the invitation for you to respond in kind. When we lead with our scars, we open the invitation for humanity to exist between us. So as you carry through the rest of this event, I encourage you 
to say something today to somebody else that makes your voice shake. Say something that terrifies you to say out loud to someone else in this room. And regardless of the outcome, whether you're accepted or rejected, you get to enjoy the rush of courage that it takes to start from the top of the ladder. You get to feel yourself grow, and there's absolutely no way that you can deny that your vulnerability is sexy. Thank you.